This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Seven Modern Times, Madame Saray. Book Seven, Chapter Two The Charity of Saint Orborosia. Every Friday evening at nine o'clock, the choicest of Alcan society assembled in the aristocratic church of Saint Mail for the Reverend Father Duyard's retreat. Prince and Princess de Boseno, Viscount and Viscountess Olive, Monsieur and Madame Bigor, Monsieur and Madame de la Tremelle were never absent. The flower of the aristocracy might be seen there, and fair Jewish baronesses also adorned it by their presence, for the Jewish baronesses of Alca were Christians. This retreat, like all religious retreats, had for its object to procure for those living in the world opportunities for recollection, so that they might think of their eternal salvation. It was also intended to draw down upon so many noble and illustrious families the benediction of Lady Orborosia, who loves the penguins. The Reverend Father Douillard strove for the completion of his task with a truly apostolical zeal. He hoped to restore the prerogatives of St. Orborosia as the patron saint of Penguinia, and to dedicate to her a monumental church on one of the hills that dominate the city. His efforts had been crowned with great success, and for the accomplishing of this national enterprise, he had already united more than a hundred thousand adherents and collected more than twenty millions of francs. It was in the choir of St. Mail that St. Orborosia's new shrine, shining with gold, sparkling with precious stones, and surrounded by tapers and flowers, had been erected. The following account may be read in the history of the miracles of the patron saint of Alca by the Abbe Plantain. The ancient shrine had been melted down during the terror, and the precious relics of the saint thrown into a fire that had been lit on the Place de Greve. But a poor woman of great piety named Roquin went by night, at the peril of her life, to gather up the calcined bones and ashes of the blessed saint. She preserved them in a jam pot, and when religion was again restored, brought them to the venerable cure of St. Mail's. The woman ended her days piously as a vendor of tapers and custodian of seats in the saint's chapel. It is certain that in the time of Father Duyard, Although faith was declining, the cult of St. Orborosia, which for three hundred years had fallen under the criticism of Canon Princeteau and the silence of the doctors of the Church, recovered and was surrounded with more pomp, more splendor, and more fervor than ever. The theologians did not now subtract a single iota from the legend. They held as certainly established all the facts related by Abbot Simplicissimus and in particular declared on the testimony of that monk that the devil, assuming a monk's form, had carried off the saint to a cave, and had there striven with her until she overcame him. Neither place nor dates caused them any embarrassment. They paid no heed to exegesis, and took good care not to grant as much to science as Canon Prince To had formerly conceded. They knew too well whither that would lead. The church shone with lights and flowers. An operatic tenor sang the famous canticle of St. Orborosia. Virgin of paradise, come, come in the dusty night, and on us shed thy beams of light. Mademoiselle Clarence sat beside her mother and in front of Viscount Clena. She remained kneeling during a considerable time, for the attitude of prayer is natural to discreet virgins and it shows off their figures. The Reverend Father Duyard ascended the pulpit. He was a powerful orator, and could at once melt, surprise, and rouse his hearers. Women complained only that he fulminated against vice with excessive harshness, and in crude terms that made them blush, but they liked him none the less for it. He treated in his sermon of the seventh trial of St. Orborosia, who was tempted by the dragon which she went forth to combat. But she did not yield, and she disarmed the monster. The orator demonstrated without difficulty that we also, by the aid of St. Orborosia, and strong in the virtue which she inspires, can in our turn overthrow the dragons that dart upon us and are waiting to devour us, the dragon of doubt, 
the dragon of impiety, the dragon of forgetfulness of religious duties. He proved that the charity of St. Orborosia was a work of social regeneration, and he concluded by an ardent appeal to the faithful to become instruments of the divine mercy. Eager upholders and supporters of the charity of St. Orborosia, and to furnish it with all the means which it required to take its flight and bear its salutary fruits. After the ceremony, the Reverend Father Douillard remained in the sacristy at the disposal of those of the faithful who desired information concerning the charity, or who wished to bring their contributions. Mademoiselle Clarence wished to speak to Father Douillard, so did Viscount Clena. The crowd was large and a queue was formed. By chance, Viscount Clena and Mademoiselle Clarence were side by side, and possibly they were squeezed a little closely to each other by the crowd. Eveline had noticed this fashionable young man, who was almost as well known as his father in the world of sport. Clena had noticed her, and as he thought her pretty, he bowed to her, then apologized and pretended to believe that he had been introduced to the ladies, but could not remember where. They pretended to believe it also. He presented himself the following week at Madame Clarence's, thinking that her house was a bit fast, a thing not likely to displease him, and when he saw Eveline again, he felt he had not been mistaken, and that she was an extremely pretty girl. Viscount Clena had the finest motor car in Europe. For three months he drove the Clarences every day over hills and plains, through woods and valleys. They visited famous sites and went over celebrated castles. He said to Eveline all that could be said, and did all that could be done to overcome her resistance. She did not conceal from him that she loved him, that she would always love him, and love no one but him. She remained grave and trembling by his side. To his devouring passion she opposed the invincible defense of a virtue conscious of its danger. At the end of three months, after having gone uphill and downhill, turned sharp corners and negotiated level crossings, and experienced innumerable breakdowns, he knew her as well as he knew the flywheel of his car, but not much better. He employed surprises, adventures, sudden stoppages in the depths of forests and before hotels, but he had advanced no farther. He said to himself that it was absurd. Then taking her again in his car, he set off at fifty miles an hour, quite prepared to upset her in a ditch or to smash himself and her against a tree. One day, having come to take her on some excursion, he found her more charming than ever, and more provoking. He darted upon her as a storm falls upon the reeds that border a lake. She bent with adorable weakness beneath the breath of the storm, and twenty times was almost carried away by its strength, but twenty times she arose, supple and bowing to the wind. After all these shocks one would have said that a light breeze had barely touched her charming stem. She smiled as if ready to be plucked by a bold hand. Then her unhappy aggressor, desperate, enraged, and three parts mad, fled so as not to kill her, mistook the door, and went into the bedroom of Madame Clarence, whom he found putting on her hat in front of a wardrobe, seized her, flung her on the bed, and possessed her before she knew what had happened. The same day, Eveline, who had been making inquiries, learned that Viscount Clena had nothing but debts, lived on money given him by an elderly lady, and promoted the sale of the latest models of a motor-car manufacturer. They separated with common accord, and Eveline began again disdainfully to serve tea to her mother's guests. End of Book 7 Chapter 2